If you've ever been on the 15 freeway between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, you will have looked around somewhere in the middle of the high desert and seen Joshua trees and yucca bushes and millions of acres of dirt. Here, the difference between Victorville and Barstow is 20 miles of creosote, not like the rest of Southern California where a little green sign with a name, elevation, and population marks the difference between Ontario and Rancho Cucamonga. I grew up in the desert in Victorville, and I spent my childhood with my siblings rolling around in the mud and skating in empty aqueducts and poking around the Mojave River. Now, our river is unique because, well, it flows north and inland, but also, for the most part, it flows underground. So the only way that you know there's a river there is a pale stretch of sand where water should be. And it was a disappointment. I drove past it every day on my way to school where I first developed an interest in writing, and I never thought that I would write about something so dry. <laughs> Be here all week. <laughs> I was inspired by the stories of Rudyard Kipling that took place in jungles and forests, or films that were shot on oak lined streets in suburbs. For me, Victorville was this disappointing, arid, lifeless valley in the middle of nowhere. And to have any fun at all, you had to go down the hill which is what we called going down the Cajon Pass into the rest of the Inland Empire or out to the coast or out to LA. To have any fun at all, you had to leave. Which is why when I went to college to study writing, I decided that I wanted to go someplace different, someplace beautiful. I went to Riverside. <laughs> And when I first got here, it was beautiful compared to Victorville. It was so alive. There were so many trees and orchards and university campuses. There was so much history. There was the Mission Inn. Oh. And there was the, the Santa Ana River. I mean, it was just a trickle, but at least it was above ground. <laughs> My first winter here, I saw exactly what I wanted to. I saw rain and I saw fog. And the hills turned green. But then something awful happened. The seasons changed. And the air got hot. And the hills caught on fire. <laughs> and the Santa Ana River dried up. And I know it sounds odd, you know, but I felt cursed. I had come from Victorville, and I showed up in this city, and it died. And I know it also sounds strange, but I felt kind of like I didn't belong based on the way that people would look at me. You know, it was almost as if they could see the Victorville dust on my skin and hear the heat in my voice. They could smell a desert rat. <laughs> and you know, for a writer or for anyone really, a feeling of alienation is something that's familiar and it can start to eat away at your confidence. For me, it had me questioning my ability to write. So after I finished some degrees down the street at La Sierra, I applied to a number of MFA programs in order to help my creative writing. And though I got an offer at a place that was closer to the ocean, my best and most promising opportunity was right here at UC Riverside. <laughs> Highlanders? <laughs> All right. And um, when I started, I realized that the pattern had continued. In this place, I felt like I was out of place, in a city where I had lived and worked for six years. Every time I started a conversation with a writer who was from a beautiful place and then moved to Riverside, I felt the confidence leak out of me. I mean, I was from a place where, you know, you have to drill 300 feet into the ground to pull up water to wash your tercel and mix your Kool-Aid. I'm sure other people, people could probably spin that into something literary, but for me, it was nothing to be proud of. I wanted to write about stuff that was places I thought were fantastic, like 
the Central Coast, like San Francisco, like San Diego, like the Pacific Northwest, places where the fog rolls over the Manzanitas and the Buckeyes reach out over the ocean. But every time I wrote a sentence about one of those places, it felt like somebody else had written it. I mean, I did my research. I looked at pictures. I studied the average annual rainfall. I looked at the indigenous species. But every time I put down a sentence, it felt incorrect and pretentious. And I thought my writing was destined to be just as dry as that Mojave River. So I thought, maybe I'll go do some traveling to mix things up. So I traveled the coast. I went up to San Francisco and stayed next to Golden Gate Park. I went and I surfed down at Black's Beach. I camped out at San Onofre. I went up to the Napa Valley, hoping that the beauty of these places would somehow rub off on me and my writing would improve. But of course it didn't. I came back to Riverside and I started just devouring any kind of advice that anybody would give me. So much so that I started to lose track of my voice and my confidence and my writing became this hodgepodge of other people's suggestions. Any semblance of that heat in my voice or that kid that came down the hill from Victorville was gone because I didn't have the confidence to hold on to anything that reminded me that I didn't belong. And this was a problem. And it wasn't just a problem with my writing. Anyone that has devoted an enormous amount of time to creating something knows that when you find out that there is something terminally corrupted in something that you've created, it's not just a disappointment. It has you questioning your purpose. If I've given this thing everything I've got and I've failed, then everything I've got must not be much at all. But I couldn't give up writing because I loved it. So I decided to take an inventory of everything I've got to see if I had anything worth putting down on paper. I was going through some boxes of books in my parents' house, and I found an old copy of a book by Rudyard Kipling called Just So Stories. And in it was a story called How the Leopard Got His Spots. And my parents used to read this to me when I was younger. And this is a story about the beginning of time when the world was so new and dull and all the animals were the color of sand and they all lived in a high desert. Now one day, the zebra, who was the color of sand, decided that he was tired of being eaten for breakfast by the leopard and the Ethiopian. So he decided to move away from the desert, to change his skin to stripes, and to hide in the forest and try and blend in. But the leopard and the Ethiopian got wise to him and they changed their skin too and followed him. The Ethiopian changed his skin black and used the extra color on his fingers to give spots to the leopard. And then they could hide too and have their breakfast. I realized that as a kid, this must have influenced me an enormous amount because this was my story as an adult. I was the zebra. I moved away from the desert to some place hoping that I could blend in, but the leopard was there to find me and remind me of who I was. All of this worrying about where I came from and what my voice was and how beautiful this place was and where I needed to go to fit in was an enormous waste of time because I didn't yet realize that a zebra in the desert is still a zebra when he gets into a forest. A desert rat is always going to be a desert rat. And the minute that I can accept that and embrace it is the moment that I can start writing something honest. It was about that time that I realized that the majority of authors that I really connect with are those who have a deep connection to their place. Flannery O'Connor and her love of the South and its inhabitants' unique ability to see the infinite in the ordinary. Derek Walcott's best poems are those that encapsulate his place of St. Lucia like objects caught in amber. Kurt Vonnegut was born in Indiana and he left what would forever be a Hoosier in the lines of his prose. Ingmar Bergman tried to move to Hollywood, but he couldn't stand to be away from Sweden, the place that imbued his films with such quiet majesty. Susan Strait dedicated her novel about Riverside, Between Heaven and Here, to my city, 
my hometown, all those who left and all those who stayed. And I always looked at my hometown as my disadvantage. When I was younger, I looked at Victorville as a place full of heat and wind and a dry riverbed. But when I wrote about it, I saw Victorville as a place where settlers and natives built their homes on the banks of the once mighty Mojave River, a place where Meckenwitz wrote Citizen Kane on Verde Ranch, a place of pride and education since their foundation, a place full of laughing and dancing people, of festivals and markets and stories. The same look of accomplishment that we have seen on the faces of those men and women, those acrobats who built the skyscrapers of New York City is the same look of accomplishment that I wrote on the faces of those men and women who made Victorville the gateway to the high desert. And all of this happened long before I was born and started complaining about it. Who the hell did I think I was to be embarrassed of Victorville? My lack of confidence in my writing came from my lack of confidence in my place. When I denied that anything good could come from Victorville, I was denying myself the opportunity to write anything worth reading. There are towns all across America full of people just like me growing up between more beautiful and more exciting places, between the cities of angels and the cities of sin. But those people have worked hard to make those places their home and enjoy the unique beauty they have to offer, like the people of Riverside. <laughs> this is for you, you better clap up. When I write Victorville now, I write about the end of the day, when the sun, it melts, like a creamsicle on the San Gabriels. I write about the night sky, where you can see every star that has ever burnt if you look hard enough. And though I have moved away and I live in a place now where the fog does roll over the manzanitas and the buckeyes do reach out over the ocean, I will always be a desert rat. <laughs> write what you know, they say. And that's where I found a voice. And though that Mojave River flows underground, that pale stretch of sand will always be a reminder to me that no matter how hot it gets, no matter how hard the wind blows, and no matter how far away I go, that river will always flow upward. And it flows in me. Thank you for your attention.